we are uh, in time and we have our last hour and our last um, lecture given by Carlos Villard. Um, you see him here. Hello, Carlos. Hi, he is now in the moment in Chile, in Santiago. Is it, is it right, in Santiago? Yes. And, um, and uh, Mark Fabian Book. I will introduce both. Uh, Carlos Villard is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Faculty of Education at the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile in Santiago. And he uh, made his PhD uh, here in uh, general pedagogy with a title, with uh, uh, investigation on uh, aesthetic experience and aesthetic building. A phenomenological and uh, Bildungstheoretical um, uh, investigation. And his research fields are aesthetics, politics, philosophy, theory of education, critical theory, and social equalities in Latin uh, America. And um, Mark Fagian Buck, he is a professor of general uh, educational science at the uh, Fern Universität in Hagen, and his uh, research fields are theory of uh, education, learning, development, pedagogical and social transformations, or uh, via mechanization, virtualization, economization um, of pedagogy, phenomenological educational studies, reform pedagogy, and uh, last but not least, uh, digital and digital media in connection to uh, education. So I'm very happy uh, both to have both here, uh, Fabian uh, in presence and Carlos uh, via Zoom. Please. Hi. Thank you very much for the introduction, Malta. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here. And the invitation we got from Malte, Johannes and Martin. To the audience, thanks for coming. Um, we rehearsed this presentation and we came out at 35, 40 minutes, so we hopefully have lots of room for discussion. So Carlos will be invisible during the presentation, but he will still be there. Uh, and then uh, he will join us with this uh, like this uh, after, after the talk. So, you can see the title. I won't repeat what is visible on, on the slides. I hope that is obvious. In the recent years, the vast field of education has been strongly affected by pervasive and partly compulsory processes of digitalization. The pandemic only accelerated what was already underway. Digitalization has not only introduced major changes in the way we experience pedagogical situations, but also in the way how we talk about them. Everyday expressions such as virtual classroom, virtual library, virtual meetings, or virtual study rooms on TikTok even, have become natural or second nature when talking about digitally mediated settings. These expressions, however, imply a prior and tacit identification of the digital with digitally uh, and with the virtual. So digital and virtual is seen as one. Second. So that is the proposed problem we're trying to address. Given that digitally mediated and traditional face-to-face -face educational situations are different, this identification is problematic for at least two reasons. First, it reinforces an opposition between virtual and corporal realities, in plural, to the detriment of a more complex understanding of reality, in singular. Secondly, it prevents us from analyzing the intricate entanglements of virtuality and corporality, that is to say, from distinguishing what is virtual in corporality and vice versa, what is corporal 
in virtuality. In this talk, we want to question this identification as it neglects experiential differences regarding both digital and virtual reality. Our thesis is that this identification is a result of a colonization of the virtual by ongoing processes of digitalization. Thus, we want to tackle debates on post-digital realities, and we will come back to that later. Um, and we do this by questioning the hegemony of the digital and instead highlighting the relevance and complexity of the virtual. In order to describe virtual and corporal realities, not as opposed, but as a part of a rich multi-dimensional reality, we, su we suggest to approach virtuality primarily in terms of proto-virtuality, a term we borrowed from Merleau-Ponty, of course. This means it is necessary to show how a primordial form of the virtual already persists and resists in our very embodied experience. We develop our thesis in four instances. First, from a historical and conceptual perspective, we briefly show how this identification arises and becomes tacit over time. Here, we analyze both expressions digital and virtual and focus on their philosophical, technological, and educational meanings. Second, drawing mainly on Merleau-Ponty's insights in the phenomenology of perception, we address three aspects of the phenomenon of portal virtuality, space, movement, and body. We argue that portal virtuality differs from and is not reducible to the experience of virtuality in digitally mediated settings. Third, we offer some examples of experiences in educational settings in which proto-virtuality and digital virtuality can and should be distinguished from one another. Finally, we make some remarks on the idea that in the age of post-digital and post-human visions, corporality persists and resists as something primordial and irreplaceable in the pedagogical field. Okay, so we come to, I don't know why it says one, 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 but I think you can figure it out. <laughs> so we come to the first point, obviously, the digital colonization of the virtual. Without claiming completeness, in the following we will analyze the expressions digital and virtual and focus on these meanings. Like I said, first, the philosophical meaning. From an etymological point of view, the term digital, of course, comes from Latin digitus, the finger, which originally refers to the very realm of corporality. That is to say, someone's usually ten fingers or toes, and the probable origin of the decimal system also, which we use to count and calculate. The original meaning of the digital has nothing to do with our current understanding of it in terms of technological devices and digital media. However, as the field of philosophy of technology shows, much of the philosophical discussion around digital tends towards device-centered perspectives, not body-centered perspectives, but device-centered perspective, which place the body as a physical device among others. On the other hand, um, the term virtual comes from Latin virtus, which originally means manly strength. Vir is the man, right? And straightforward power, as well as potency and efficiency. Besides this general meaning, the term virtual has been historically defined in at least three ways. First, through identification, secondly, through distinction, thirdly, through intertwining. The first way refers to the traditional identification of the virtual with the potential in the context of ontological and also epistemological approaches. In Greek antiquity, antiquity Aristotle, of course, um, as well as in the Middle Ages, with uh, scholastic philosophers, Thomas uh, Aquinas, for example, and in the Renaissance, the virtual is regarded as potentiality 
while the real stands for actuality. Thus, virtuality and reality are not separate realms because it is not possible to actualize what is not already present in some way as potentiality. The second way addresses the modern discovery of the virtual as an autonomous realm, independent of potentiality and actuality. A leading author in this regard is, of course, Henri Bergson. Bergson thinks of virtuality in relation to actuality by criticizing the subordination of the possible to the real. According to him, this subordination assumes that the possible is less than the real, that is to say, the real is thought of as the possible with the additional quality of existence. One of Bergson's key insights is that the virtual is not simply exhausted in its actualization, there's still some surplus, nor can it be completely uh, encompass the real. And then the third way, of course, implies intertwining between the virtual and the real. In the extreme case, this means that the virtual and the real merge. Drawing on Bergson's insights, uh, Gilles Deleuze moves in exactly this direction when he claims that the virtual is fully real, although at the same time opposed to the actual. It's a bit confusing, but so is postmodernism. Interestingly, a definition of the virtual as real inevitably leads to the question of the status of the real. If we ask what is real in the virtual, we also have to ask what is virtual in the real. So, second dimension, technological meaning. The technological meaning of both the digital and the virtual cannot be properly understood without reference to experience as a phenomenon involving mediations or media. In a phenomenological sense, this means that experience is embodied and takes place in and towards the world. As Husserl suggests, the lived body that we are, Leib, exists as a medium of our experience since experience is somehow co-constituted by this very body. The body is the zero point, the null point, of all our experiences and orientations. It's the transfer point, Umschlagstelle, between the natural and the spiritual. At the same time, the world appears as the environment in which embodied experience occurs. Considering both medial aspects, the body as a medium of experience and the world as environment, the technological meaning of the digital and the virtual can be described in relation to the paradigmatic experience of immersion. Immersion originally refers to the experience of being submerged in water. It implies both a change of medium and also a change of orientation and functioning of the body itself as a medium. The body encounters certain resistances in the aquatic environment. That's what I suppose all of you have experienced. A lack of oxygen, a temperature drop, a pressure increase, things like these. The experience of immersion challenges usual terrestrial conditions of human life and demands the de de development of specific techniques of the body, as Mauss says. These techniques attempt to diminish or overcome to some degree the awareness and noticeability of the environment in order to allow for the fullest possible adaptation to it. As an example, we can think of the swimming technique called total immersion introduced by American swimming coach Terry Lawlin, which you can see here. The logo of Lawlin's swim program shows a human being that resembles a dolphin. Swimming like one only works if humans develop dolphin-like skills while keeping resistance to the water medium as low as possible. Virtuality deploys here not only in terms of the human potential to inhibit another medium, it also appears as the autonomization of an experiential realm. The embodied experience of immersion becomes a metaphor. 
that accounts for the logic of digitally mediated experiences of the virtual. Experiences of digital virtuality tend towards the progressive overcoming of resistance involved in the change of media. So digital environments gain reality as they operate as an increasingly accurate approximation to the reality of embodied experience and its inherent virtuality. This is, I think, that goes without saying, but maybe we can talk more about this later. So, third point, educational meaning. Discourses on the digital condition in education typically assume an identification between the digital and the virtual. This can be seen not only in the idea of virtual reality, but also in everyday expressions. Like I said in the beginning, virtual classroom, virtual library, virtual meetings, virtual study rooms, and so on and so on. The original meaning of the digital as referring to the body is shifted to the realm of technological devices. And in doing so, the understanding of virtuality is limited to the potential of um, the digital technological medium. Digital virtual reality is a reality in which the virtual is exhausted in its actualization. There is no surplus anymore. Thus, in current educational settings, virtuality is not seen as a quality of its own that has to be taken into account when talking about teaching and learning, but rather as a digitally mediated feature that ideally fosters learning outcome in a technical sense. The idea of virtuality as something that transcends the current limitations of thinking and acting vanishes within this merge with the digital as a tool for a preset and functional goal. One might argue that by blurring virtuality and digital in one, in educational thinking, this, the latter will eventually contribute to a unification or mainstreaming of teaching bereft of fantasy. This is, paradoxically enough, the exact opposite of which is demanded from, from young professionals who are supposed to think outside of the box. Also, it is in line with McLuhan's famous critique of the book press, and it's very similar in its effect on the population. Meredith Broussard coined the term techno-chauvinism to convey a widely held belief that everything and anything can be solved as long as technology is sufficiently advanced. In her book, Artificial Unintelligence, she reminds us of two fundamental flaws within this way of thinking. Firstly, it is not a technological problem when, for example, an algorithm becomes racist in its suggestions. It is the base data it feeds upon that is the problem. In other words, technology cannot solve what is at core a social problem. In the same way, digital tools cannot substitute schooling and teaching as a riskful and social practice. The second reminder given by Bosar is that, and you really have to read this book, it's really good. I, I, I can't recommend it enough. It's, it's seriously, it's a really good read. The second reminder given by Bosar is that, almost unnoticed, it is us who adapt to technology and not the other way around. Instead of insisting that educational practice cannot be automated, digitized or digitally virtualized, many educators bend over backwards to include technological solutions in educational and consequently social settings without thinking about the ramifications or without caring, I don't know. As we will see in the following, Understanding virtuality in a non-digital way opens up perspectives that allow us to do justice to educational practice beyond techno-chauvinism. So we come to the next point, which is of course one, embodied experience and proto-virtuality. In his seminal work, The Structure of Behavior, Merleau-Ponty advances two ideas that allow us to think of virtuality as a proto-phenomenon of embodied experience. Drawing on a critique of behaviorism, of course, you know the biography of Merleau-Ponty that led to this, he argues that perceptual experience is one not reducible to the vital dialectic of the organism and its environment, 
and two, it does not imply the emergence of an object in an empty consciousness. While the former idea suggests that perceptual experience exceeds the realm of actual interactions, the latter indicates that consciousness is not detached from the phenomenal world. Both ideas are further developed in the phenomenology of perception. In this work, Merleau-Ponty critically reformulates the Husserlian notion of intentionality of act, or act intentionalität, that refers to consciousness as consciousness of something, Bewusstsein von etwas. Merleau-Ponty understands the sensorimoto dimension of the body, the entanglement of perception and movement as an original intentionality, as he calls it. This intentionality emerges from our corporal anchorage in the world and is engaged, pre-reflective, non-objectifying. Therefore, the body does not express itself based on internal representations of the world in a transcendental consciousness. Instead, it is itself an expression engaged in and towards the world. This original intentionality draws on the complex and ambivalent character of embodied experience. The consciousness of having a body, a körper, given in a certain way, exposed, vulnerable, located in an objective space and time, alongside other physical bodies, presupposes the experience of being that lived body. The tension between having and being a body, Plesna, for example, enabled specific experiences of virtual space, movement, and corporality. And this is what we will expect on, expand on now. First, the space. Although the body can be described within objective spatial coordinates along with other physical human and non-human bodies, for example, I am now standing here in this room at a certain distance from you, the original intentionality of the body is not exhausted in this experience of spatial position. The body is rather in a spatial situation that allows the deployment of corporal movements. Virtual space is a situational space. This means actual movements in a shared physical space coexist with virtual movements bound to the specific situation of the body in and towards the world. And if I may give you a very profane example, you probably can relate to when you lie in bed or sit on the sofa and you think about getting up, you do this a couple of times until you finally do it. This is what we mean. Uh, when saying there is a proto-virtual idea of our movement in space. We think about doing it before we finally do it, but, but without us being in the situation in the first place, we couldn't think about it. Second point, movement. Virtual movements are intimately linked to perceptual experience. In fact, what we perceive bodily and sensually arouses a host of intentions, as Merleau-Ponty calls it, a surplus that calls upon the body as a center of virtual action towards the body itself and the world. Thus, the intentional act of perception opens up a horizon of corporal virtuality. As Merleau-Ponty puts it, each stimulus applied to the body arouses a kind of virtual movement rather than an actual one. The part of the body in question sheds its anonymity, is revealed by the presence of a particular tension as a certain power of action within the framework of the anatomical apparatus. In the emergence of this corporal virtuality from perceptual experience, the senses intercommunicate by opening on the structure of the thing. This means embodied experience takes place as an intersensory experience. And you probably know all these examples by Merleau-Ponty. Like, we can not only see the ice cream, we can see the, the temperature of the ice cream. We suppose it is cold. It's the same, of course, with a glass of beer or whatever. Let us consider this example to understand this point. When we see the display case of an ice cream shop, the sense of sight is stimulated by a bunch of colors and shapes. If we eat ice cream, however, other senses, such as touch, taste, and smell, are also stimulated. However, 
tactile gustatory and olfactory experiences are not exhausted in our experience of the ice cream, we are actually touching, tasting or smelling. As regular ice cream consumers, and I consider myself as one and Carlos too, I can speak for him in this regard, in some way we can already touch, taste or even smell the ice cream with our gaze and the feel, the tension it produces in our bodies, especially in hot days and when we experience pangs of hunger and cravings. And in this case, just looking at the mouth-watering ice cream in the display case arouses virtual movements towards it that may or may not be actualized in concrete actions. Usually, it actualizes in concrete actions, just in my case, just saying. Third point, the body. What is more, virtual movements deployed in a virtual space uh, lead us to think about the constitution of a virtual body. In this respect, Merleau-Ponty argues that what counts in the embodied experience is not the body. As it in fact is, as a thing in objective space, but as a system of possible actions, a virtual body with its phenomenal place defined by its task and situation. My body is wherever there is something to be done. In other words, the virtual body emerges in the very engagement with tasks and situations. It transgresses the domain of the physical body that we have as a given thing located in a measurable space and time, but without overcoming it. The virtual body does not imply an escape from reality, but on the contrary, a deeper engagement with it. In a certain, certain way, the physical body remains as a reference point described in terms of an object of the external world. Both the virtual and the physical body coexist at the same time. However, this does not prevent the subject of experience from having the feeling of being immersed in another world. Merleau-Ponty explains this feeling in terms of transposition. Therefore, the virtual body is fully real and by no means neutral. It affects the subject from which it emerges as a relative autonomous projection. At the same time, it triggers a reorganization of the human sensorium, that is to say, it reorganizes its spatial-temporal relationships in order to inhabit the medium to which it appears. Let us consider two examples to illustrate this point. One second, please. The first picture shows a situation of everyday life, uh, at least uh, for some men. When I shave in front of a mirror, my physical body is projected in the medium of the mirror. The reflected body is precisely a virtual body. And its phenomenal place is defined by the action of shaving that it makes possible. The virtual movement of the body reflected in the mirror is visible and has a real effect on the physical body by showing precisely the location of the razor. Just imagine if it hadn't, we would cut ourselves all the time. The second picture refers to a paradigmatic case of virtual movement from the artistic field, pantomime. The mime moves in a world that is invisible to us, but which we can nevertheless perceive. For example, the mime can inhabit a house open and close doors and so on and so on. Although we do not see his house, we know that he inhabits it because of the movements he actualizes. He can open a door, enter and lie down on his bed and so on. That house, physically absent, is virtually present. What amuses us and generates admiration in this situation is that the mime makes precise and subtle movements to inhabit a house that is physically absent and invisible but still real. So let's proceed to the next uh, big and the finale, the, goal, the, the big finale, proto virtual and digital experiences. 
As we have seen, virtuality is a constitutive part of live worlds, but not only in a technological sense. Indeed, digital virtuality is a rather recent phenomenon in human history. From the point of view of educational practice, the distinction between experiences of proto-virtuality and digital virtuality is highly relevant because it allows us to see to what extent corporality persists and resists as something primordial and irreplaceable in pedagogical settings dominated by instrumental rationalities as such as that of techno-chauvinism. Interestingly, Merleau-Ponty suggests that social practices are based on experiences of proto-virtuality. He claims that the intersubjective dimension of an embodied experience begins, quote, as soon as we designate a point in space with our finger, end quote. The pointing gesture refers to both the actual place from which it is done and to a virtual elsewhere as its correlate. This leads us to rethink pointing, zeigen, as a fundamental pedagogical form, and I'm pretty sure Malte and uh, Salis published something on this in English too, right? Yes, thank you. One quite prevalent example for the difference between proto-virtuality and digital virtuality may lie in Zoom meetings we suppose all of you have had plenty of during the course of the past two years. In another paper, we argued that these settings are merely simulations of social settings since they undermine corporality, spatial relation, and movement. We would argue that the simulation lies in the pretense of showing a whole classroom or a team or any social setting. Instead, it accumulates very limited perspectives, just heads, and does not allow us to bodily and socially relate to others. These meetings are indeed digital, but they are not virtual, as there is no space in time, sorry, there's no space in between, which is explicitly planned and accounted for by the platform. There is no eye contact between students when someone says something clever, clever and or incredibly stupid, as you probably can relate to. In every classroom, this happens. There's also no way how I, as a teacher, can relate to my class by walking through the classroom, making eye contact with those who speak or those who disrupt the lesson. All these actions are proto-virtual since they rely on my embodied corporal intentions but may not even be actions per se. But they are not virtual in the sense of digital virtuality. Another example are platforms for digital classroom management, such as Class Dojo. These are widely popular in the US, as far as we know, but more rare in any other parts of the world. In the way they pre-structure interaction, they deprive educational settings from spatial, corporal, and especially movement. Once again, one could argue that movement in regular classroom settings are neither intended nor the regular modus operandi within teaching, except for physical education, of course. But, as we have shown before, even the slightest embodied movements, for example, eye rolling or sighing when someone says something for the fifth time, are vital for pedagogical settings to work. We do not aim at transgressing or transposing the body, we aim at recognizing it as a part of human beings, as addressees of our actions within a certain situation. And these situations, of course, are pedagogical. It is this acting in a tactful manner that allows us to differentiate education as an ethical praxis that is not replaceable by automated actions, however elaborated these may be. And just at the end, very, very briefly, some concluding remarks, right after having a sip of water, sorry. To conclude, we would like to point out some of the limitations involved in thinking of virtuality and corporality as intertwined phenomena in terms of proto-virtuality. First, proto-virtuality has a teleological and anthropocentric core, which prevents us from properly 
describing and understanding forms of non-human virtuality, as in the alien, the other, the strange. This point also shows the limit of a theory of technology as an extension of the human body, as, uh, for example, McLuhan proposed. Although Merleau-Ponty never developed such a theory, in the phenomenology of perception, he implicitly relates the corporal, uh, corporal uh, virtuality to an idea of technology as a human extension. For example, he argues that a blind man who habitually uses a stick to walk no longer, no longer perceives the stick as an external device. It rather becomes an extension of his touch. In any case, and one could come up, of course, with um, plenty of other examples for that. In any case, this is not to say that proto-virtuality could not and should not relate to new phenomena like poetry and fine arts done by artificial intelligence. I don't know if you're following up on this, but it's becoming very interesting these days. Um, on the contrary, this is something we have to work on. And the second point, it is difficult, really difficult to isolate proto-virtuality from imagination, deliberate thinking or unintended trips on LSD in the California desert, if you are uh, well versed with Foucault, uh, because it is heavily intertwined with our embodied existence and our social surroundings. It may be useful to introduce the moment of withdrawal or deprivation to approximate how proto-virtuality and intention relate to each other. There's a lot to be done on a theoretical level that Merleau-Ponty could not account for nor anticipate, which, of course, is, I think, very obvious. Still, proto-virtuality may serve as a useful concept and a reminder of the limitations of technical influence on the human condition, a concept that has to be overcome if one believes the post-humanists and disciples of the concept of singularity, we have to become one with, uh, with computers, um, and which we, of course, oppose fundamentally, which has probably become very obvious. Thank you very much. <laughs>